So, um, effectively, the talk is about the, the new platform that we are about to introduce in orbit for doing uh, spectrum sensing or uh, dynamic spectrum access types of uh, radios and to sort of try to expand some of the things that we already have to, to play with the, with the new technology nicer. So, <clears throat> first, just to refresh everybody's mind, um, Orbit does already have uh, the workhorse of cognitive radio research hardware, which is the USRP, and it has, actually has both USRP and USRP2s, um, which are, of course, the, the cornerstone of the, of the so-called new radio project, software-defined radio uh, framework that, that most people use and are familiar with, as well as some other radios. And I'll, I'll very briefly talk about um, our uh, next generation, or what we call the Genie CR kit um, hardware, just to sort of show you how things are moving quite quickly from traditional way people do uh, software-defined or cognitive radio applications to sort of something that, that hopefully will soon be readily available and, and um, enable at scale experimentation. So our plans as far as Orbit is concerned to sort of take as many of these platforms, plug them in, and let people figure out what to do with them. And the plan is currently to get at least to 64 um, cognitive radios, cognitive capable radios, uh, before the year's end. Now, CR kit. So this is for, for those of you, I mean, we did a few presentations on this subject uh, earlier in the prior IVs. The uh, Genie CR kit was essentially an attempt to develop a both hardware and software platform that will allow for very efficient, advanced cognitive radio uh, software implementations on the, as, pos as much as possible, off-the-shelf platforms that are available. And so, as part of that effort, we were trying to develop what we call the CR kit framework, which is effectively a set of tools uh, that enable efficient radio implementations. And the biggest problem with the uh, uh, Cognitive radio research in general is the fact that it requires both hardware expertise, RF understanding, software expertise, and of course DSP and communications um, expertise. And there are very few people who have all of these. And typically, you either have a EE students who are struggling with the VHDL and, and, and hardware programming, or you have a CS students who are very good programmers but have no idea about communications. It's very hard to sort of put them all together. And so, one of the things that we sort of try to do is to develop the framework that will sort of simplify this and, and streamline the whole development process. And as part of that process, we developed what we call the, the application environment, where we consider an application your typical radio transmitter or radio receiver. We try to hide the complexity of under, hardware underneath it and sort of follow the, the Simulink or, or, if you want, a lab view approach to developing radios. And there are all sorts of issues, and I really don't want to spend too much time on it, other than to sort of say that the framework is available for people to play with, including integration with Orbit and an ability to run larger scale experiments. Now, if you look at sort of the whole gamut of things that are part of this framework, you know, you have um, effectively three components, if you want. You have a hardware platform, and I'll touch base on that. You have a software platform which is running on the node meaning uh, a general purpose CPU uh, based hardware next to the um, actual hardware platform. And then of course you have a notion of the test bed where you have a large number of these and you're trying to do large scale experiments, right? And so each of these is sort of shown in this uh, tree diagram. And of course, um, it's all sitting on a, on a particular platform that we used uh, in Genie, which is the off the shelf FPGA, meaning the Avnet based platform. And this is the older version on which we attached uh, um, the RF front end, with, uh, which was fairly um, sort of interesting platform at the time. The RF goes from 300 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. Actually, we, we tested it even up higher than that to 7 gigahertz. And it has 25 megahertz of baseband. But the more interesting part is the fact that you have four full duplex simultaneous RF channels on that platform, which means that you can do really sophisticated experiments with multi-radio front ends. Right? And of course, there are certain characteristics that were sort of um, representative of the, of the deployment at the time. Now, as far as 
how do we use this in the whole the whole concept? You have the um, process which sort of hides the hardware completely. We would love to hide the software as well, following the sort of GNU radio or, or LabVIEW principle, where even the code that you are using on the general purpose CPU platform is sort of consisting of the blocks that you are tying into a flow graph. Um, and of course, um, at the very bottom, you have all these applications, including um, cognitive radio or dynamic spectrum access applications, which you are dynamically pushing onto the hardware platform and doing your experiments. And of course, Orbit as a, frame, uh, Orbit as a, as a platform comes into a picture of how do you orchestrate this on a larger scale. And the larger scale is typically more than two, right? I mean, if you really look at the cognitive radio stuff, papers usually talk about two radios talking to each other. And unfortunately, um, the whole idea of using cognitive radio as, as a concept is to improve performance in high density or large scale. Uh, things and, and you know I'm, I'm not sure whether two is should be considered a large scale, really. Um, as far as what what's involved, you know you have a, a, of course in our case we are using Simulink as a sort of top level um, platform for development of the application. And again, application for us is the actual radio application, not not you know your Facebook and your phone or uh, traditional uh, computer science applications sense. Um, so you have, uh, unfortunately, still three separate flows, and this is where most of the problems come from. You have the Simulink flow, you have a Xilinx flow, which is, of course, these boards are Xilinx based, and then you have the CRKit flow, which is our own stuff, right? And uh, to make a long story short, the big problem is if any of these flows fails, it's very hard to figure out why and, and what's wrong. So that is still something that we are trying to address in the, in the next uh, generation of, of frameworks. And that brings me now to really a uh, sort of focus of this talk, which is the Wiser. And the Wiser is the, uh, and I forgot even what the acronym stands for, but I'll remember, uh, is the NSF CRI project that was just awarded recently to, uh, it's a joint collaboration, collaborative project between uh, University of Colorado in Boulder and, and Rutgers. It involves um, uh, Dick Grunwald and, and a couple of people at, at Colorado, and of course our team here in, in, at, at Rutgers. And the idea is to sort of push this concept of CR kit to the next level. And the reason why is because in the meantime, there was a, uh, a sort of strategic shift in the industry from sort of pushing from, from collection of components that build typical software-defined radios or cognitive radios to sort of more mainstream development of components and, and chips, especially targeted for, for these applications. And so um, the main goals are listed. Of course, uh, arguably the most interesting um, part is this last bullet item, which is the reference implementation, or should I call it deployment of these platforms on the campus of various locations, as many as we can afford, and sort of doing really dynamic spectrum access experiments and, and data collection um, in real environment. Now, the hardware is, and the reason why I'm sort of, um, uh, why we had to sort of refocus our efforts on the framework is really the, uh, the Zinc, so-called Zinc platform, which is uh, Xilinx sort of decided that it's time to add uh, general pur purpose CPU with their programmable fabric and that's how the Zinc platform was born. So that was one sort of advancement in hardware. The other one was, of course, analog devices, seeing all these wide-band uh, front-end applications and cognitive radio requirements, decided it's time to sort of build a single chip um, RF front-end, which now is approaching, uh, if you look at the specs, it's 400 megahertz to 4 gigahertz, which is sort of approaching the, the, the um, point where it's really capable of supporting serious uh, wideband applications. And if you look at it, it's actually 125 megahertz of baseband. Unfortunately, this combination is not yet powerful enough in the sense that Zinc platform itself cannot easily handle complex, because of the, of the uh, size of FPGA fabric, cannot handle complex uh, RF or radio applications at 125 megahertz. So there is still uh, a long way to go, but the, the actual emphasis is really that if you look at the analog front end, analog devices front end, 
it's so-called FNC-based board, meaning that you can plug it into a traditional large-scale FPGA uh, 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 platform and, you know, of course, utilize much more of the resources that are available on, on such platforms. However, a beautiful thing about the platform is the fact that this Zinc, meaning this FPGA chip, is actually running Linux, full-blown Linux. So you know, suddenly have a, a platform where all these components are sitting on a fairly affordable uh, 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 board. And by the way, this combo costs around $800, which is really um, uh, very affordable. In the meantime, of course, we are still developing our own platform. And you know, again, the attempt is to sort of push this to the limit. And we are talking about uh, still 100 megahertz to sort of uh, 700 gig, uh, 7 gigahertz uh, RF front end, but with baselines going up to 500 megahertz, right? And that's sort of, even though it's, most people sort of say, no, no, this is ridiculous because power consumption of such a platform is huge. I mean, it sort of presents an interesting platform where you can start to do things which, are, which were sort of unimaginable even a few years back. Now, another set of interesting things that's happening is that you are starting to see proliferation of these multi-core engines. And in the meantime, the Epiphany multi-core engine became really, really affordable. So if you look at this particular board and its parallel board, it is the same zinc board that we were using for RF development, to which they actually plugged in. And you can see it on the, on the picture here at the bottom end. So and you will see it later in the, in the flag. This little board, which is literally a very small board, is a 64-core engine that you can do all sorts of very interesting things. And now the idea is really to take one large FPGA board with probably zinc on it as a, as a supporting um, CPU platform, attach the RF front end from analog devices, which is FMC-based connector, attach the uh, parallel board, which is also FMC connector, and now you have a really, really extremely powerful, powerful platform, which uh, most people can easily afford. By the way, the the, uh, the parallel board, the, the actual 64 core board is $95, right? And it's only six or seven watts of power consumption. So you can even contemplate putting it on the mobile platform in both price and um, uh, uh, power consumption, right? So now, um, where does this bring us? Uh, we now have to take our framework, um, sort of adjust it, uh, do major adjustment, because now suddenly you have a, a sort of different bus inside the FPGA. Um, you have a built-in uh, ARM cores inside, and you have to sort of move away from the soft cores that we used in the previous frameworks, uh, in the previous version of the framework, and sort of try to push things towards supporting multiple clock domains, uh, whether we are using single um, RF front end or multiple RF front ends, in order to, to expand capabilities and to support more um, varied applications, right? And again, applications are, are um, in our case, radio components that we are deploying dynamically on, on the platform. So this is where I would stop, and of course, if you come into the lab in the afternoon for the demos, you'll be able to see all these platforms in action. We'll show a few simple things we can do. We can also show you a more complex thing if you really want to. But you know, um, the, the idea is that these are readily available and, and people can play with it. All of these platforms are part of the orbit and are public resource that all the academic institutions can use. Any questions?